I always wanted, expected, to, to grow up and, and become him. But that thing inside of him, that's not me. I, I don't want to be the Batman anymore. Robin is my favorite superhero. Not Dick Grayson, not Jason Todd, maybe Tim Drake, but mostly Robin. Pretty much anyone who has picked up the mantle has piqued my interest largely because of the inherent theme represented in the character of Robin. One of the things I love about superheroes is the fact that a number of different people or personalities can embody one title or one mask. Captain America isn't just Steve Rogers. The Flash is not just Barry Allen. The thing that can bind a character like Wally West to Barry Allen, thus making them both The Flash, is a string of ideals or themes. In the modern era, there is no bigger hero than Batman. Sure, Superman might have a slight edge in name recognition, but take a poll of 100 people on the street and I'm sure a majority are going to tell you Batman is their favorite superhero. And it's easy to see why. Not only does he have probably the most movies out of the pantheon of comic book characters, but easily has some of the very best, from Tim Burton to Christopher Nolan. But this fame transcends reality, even going so far as to affect the very world in which Batman lives. How many times have you read a comic where one of the characters gush over getting to meet the Cape Crusader. In this line of thinking, what does it mean to be Robin? It means you are the sidekick. You are not just Batman in training. You are recognizable to almost anyone, but not for your own accomplishments, personality, or abilities, but for being the second half of Batman and Robin. I mean, think about it. How many people even know that there have been a multitude of Robins in the past? Of those people, how many know Damian Wayne? I'd be willing to guess very few. To be Robin is to be significant for being insignificant. It is to live in the shadow of the world's most famous detective. A good Robin story will explore the dark feelings of insecurity that one might go through wearing that red and green. But this isn't exclusive to him, only exemplified. Really, this can be extended to most sidekicks of the famous heroes. For every Barry Allen, there is a Wally or a Bart. For every Aquaman, a Kaldor or Garth. For every Superman, or Connor, or Jonathan. The theme of inferiority is rampant with these characters and is a huge driving force behind my love for things like the Teen Titans, or for the purposes of this video, Young Justice. When you start the first episode of Young Justice, one of the first things you'll see is blue text at the bottom left of your screen with the words Gotham City on it, followed up by the appearance of Mr. Freeze in his rampage against innocent civilians. When interrupted by a flying metal projectile, Freeze exclaims that Batman has finally arrived. Already, we have introduced an aspect to Young Justice perhaps foreign to a select group of viewers. That is, those introduced to the character of Robin through the very popular cartoon Teen Titans in the early 2000s. Now, Teen Titans is great. I'm not going to go out here and disparage a cartoon so vital to my love for superheroes growing up. But one of the oddest things to come from that show is in what it doesn't bring to the table. There is a single reference to Batman in its entire three-year run. Despite so much of its airtime dedicated to the character of Robin, all that's shown of our Dark Knight is a swarm of bats flying through the air as Robin rejects Slade's offer of mentorship, claiming to already have a father. That is not even an actual appearance, merely an illusion. An obvious one, but nonetheless. Teen Titans rarely, if ever, dealt with the themes of being a sidekick. I mean, we see it more with Starfire and her sister than probably anything else. But how could we expect it to when it refuses to acknowledge the existence of major heroes? I'm more than sure there is some sort of background, legal, production issue that made it so these appearances were impossible. But surprisingly, Young Justice has no such issue. The Batarangs that fly towards Mr. Freeze are not of Batman, but rather a young Dick Grayson, to which Mr. Freeze says, Oh, boy wonder. The bat sent you to drag me off to prison. Frankly, I'm underwhelmed. Immediately after, Batman shows up and we enter a montage of the rest of the characters in their respective mentors, each one pining to hurry through their activities and get to some sort of special celebration. If you haven't seen Young Justice and want to remain spoiler free, this is where you're going to want to stop. Most characters in the show in some way represent the inferiority or just the general downside to living life as a sidekick. For Aqualad, it is watching as the life he left behind slowly moves on without him. Having seized the opportunity to work under Aquaman, Calder finds the love of his life with his best friend, having bonded in his absence. In a moment like that, doubt arises about one's path, about whether or not his role as a sidekick is worth the cost. For Superboy, he knows no life outside of being a clone. With an uncanny resemblance and a similar set of powers, Connor lives in constant comparison to Superman. But he's not as strong as Superman. He can't fly, he doesn't have x-ray vision, he can't do the laser eyes, and he's angry. So much angrier than Superman would ever be. 
All of these characters embody the themes of insignificance, but none better than the character of Roy Harper, aka Red Arrow. The interesting thing about Roy is that without him, none of the characters probably would have formed their own team. That special celebration alluded to earlier was supposed to be their induction into the Justice League, or so they thought. When in actuality, it turned out to be nothing more than a glorified tour, it was Roy who became outspoken about the injustices occurring, with Wally, Dick, and Calder all relatively indifferent with only a pinch of sadness. It was the anger of Roy and his storming off that led them all to seeing their worth for what it was and deciding to take matters into their own hands. Now here's where things get interesting. We learn at the end of season one that Roy Harper as we knew him was merely a clone. A sleeper agent slipped into the good guy's hands years and years ago with the subconscious motivation of joining the Justice League. This was the cause behind his strong reaction and not being inducted that day. When this is found out, we're left in a very interesting place because what it basically means is that the very idea that was the catalyst in the creation of our team of sidekicks was not one of natural creation. It was incepted into their minds by a group of villains. The thought that being a sidekick was something to be ashamed about and that your worth was only realized when you were accepted into the league was one entirely manufactured. There's an interesting line in the second to last episode of season one by a character named Rocket. Outside of minor background appearances, Rocket was pretty much introduced this episode. Yet despite such a late entry, she has one of the most memorable lines in the entire show. Dick, seeing his friend Roy finally get inducted to the league, makes the claim that no one will ever call Red Arrow a sidekick again. That's when Rocket says this. Since when is being a sidekick a bad thing? You sidekicks were my inspiration. Open up on season two and we're five years into the future. The team was expanded with a number of new B-tier heroes and sidekicks alike from Blue Beetle to Beast Boy all the way to Wonder Girl and Bumblebee. Now the interesting thing is some of our members have gone on to join the league characters like Rocket and Zatanna. And we learned that Robin, now Nightwing, Superboy, and Miss Martian all have open invitations to go with them at any point. Despite that, the three of them remain firm in their positions as leaders of their own team. With the revelation that Roy was a clone not acting of his own accord, but rather the will of the villains, negative association with the idea of being a sidekick became hampered, if not destroyed. The team was no longer a stepping stone while they all worked their way towards the League. Instead, it was an opportunity to do things people like Batman and Superman could never do. Not because they're superior, but because they're different. The team became its own entity. We see this in the very first episode of Season 2 when Gamma Squad goes off order and does incredibly risky things outside of their instructed mission, all for the larger goal. With the old team, the good of this situation would be acknowledged, sure, but it'd be prefaced with the idea that their actions were insubordination. You'll each receive a written evaluation detailing your many mistakes. Until then, good job almost as a reminder that they were inferior and just being let off the hook this time around, but not anymore. This time, under the leadership of Nightwing with the entire league behind him, Gamma Squad is congratulated. No ifs, ands, or buts. But that's a minor moment, let's go even bigger. One of the overarching aspects to this time skip was Calder's turn to the dark side and allying with Black Manta. This was one of the most dramatic plot twists of the entire show when it was revealed and honestly solidified Young Justice as one of the greats. But if you've seen Young Justice, then you know that's only half the story because technically that's only set up for a further plot twist, which is that Calder is undercover and not evil at all. The revelation of that was mind-blowing. I mean, Jesus Christ, what's one step above great because that's what this show is now? And what are the chances of that happening with the Justice League? By staying with the team and embracing the quote-unquote insignificance and lack of fame, Nightwing and Calder were able to construct a genius, though risky plan with layers and layers of subterfuge. Superman could not do that. Aquaman could not do that. It was only achievable with this set of sidekicks. Sidekicks are so rarely represented in the mainstream media of film due to their lack of market appeal, and major heroes tend not to see the light of day on television due to that being wasted potential. In that gray area where the two get to meet, we get these CW shows, which are... I don't know, fine sometimes? But Young Justice was a surprisingly unique show in the fact that it was able to seamlessly merge the worlds of major heroes like the Justice League into that of the smaller world with our cast of sidekicks in a way that only the comics could otherwise. And unlike the CW shows, it does not squander this opportunity, instead delivering on an insanely compelling turn of events, all with the strong message of self-respect, recognizing your worth, and... 
Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like and let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you really enjoyed the video, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash KatoIT in which you can pledge a couple bucks to join the likes of Paige Mulder, Renegade68, the Hunter Hunter 2011 Dick Riding Association, H2 Mass, Spencer I Rule at Games, Doji, Wazani Mifunde, Miguel Torres, and Lerpa Anuj. Thank you all for the support. My name is Hoodie, this is Kato, and we will see you all soon.